we're going into, uh, as we go into the next section, uh, we're really into a, a different thing. Um, the next section that we go into is really, uh, you'll have one more, one more kind of section. Uh, oh, no, you're done. You're, you're done with this section. So when we come into it next, when we start next next week, we'll be going into contemporary theorists. Um, these are people who, some of them are alive. Um, that, that's where we are. Uh, some of them are, are still alive. Some of them are alive and very old. And some of them are dead. And my favorite one is probably would still be alive, except for he drank a lot of dope. So, and so he's dead. Um, but so we, we've looked at things. We've looked at almost no, a little more than 2,000 years at this point, um, which is a lot. That's a lot of, of stuff to read, to read. And the rest of the book takes place, all the theories will take place within... Eighty years. So we've looked at two thousand. Now we're going to look at eighty uh, for for the rest of the book. And so what you have at this point is actually pretty valuable. I think if, if you've been doing all the readings and keeping up, what you have is pretty valuable because you have an understanding of the first two thousand years of communication. And one of the ways that we can divide up all of this, we can take each of these people that we've, that we've read about, um, whether it's Isocrates or Plato or Aristotle or Cicero or Quintilian or Augustine or Ramus or Hugh Blair, Waitley, and we can put them into two, into two categories. Uh, which I think would be would be an interesting thing to do and, and a fun way maybe to spend the next 45 minutes, if it's okay to you. And these two categories, <clears throat> don't do that. Uh, these two categories, I'm, I, would, I, I would describe, can you guys see that or is it too much glare on there? It's too, yeah. too much glare, you can see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Standing over here, you can't see it. It's too much better. Uh, the two categories that I think that you could uh, you could put these into, you can call them either people who develop the discipline of communication or who define the discipline of communication. Right? So these are the the. Uh, People who define the discipline of communication or people who develop the, the, the discipline of communication. And these two are really opposites. And I might say, well, why would that be opposite to develop and define? These, these are both good things. Well, they are. Without them, we wouldn't do both. But they're opposites. Because when you define something, uh, when you define something, Define a word. Can somebody define a word? I don't care what word. <clears throat> a word is a part of speech. A word. You can define the word word. And you can define the word word as a part of speech. Probably narrower than that even. Right? Sure. So what would be even more? Is a, or so is a phrase as a part of speech. Sure. A classification of matter? No, yeah. a word is not, is not matter. Well, words aren't matter at all. Uh, so the words don't matter, uh, which is well, they, they are not matter. You know, we can kind of kind of narrow it down. A word is well, if we said the smallest understandable part of speech. So because of the smallest, we get to phonemes, which could be like er, yeah. as in run er. But that doesn't make any sense. And it's the smallest understandable part of speech. So when we do that, when we define something, what we just did is we take something and we make it smaller. 
That's what defining means. Uh, the root word of define is fine, right? Uh, the root word of define is fine, uh, is, and it's the word we get finite from. So when you define something, you make it finite, you make it smaller. And, those, and, and so you contract it, you narrow it. When you define something, you narrow it. It becomes more and more narrow as you go along. You limit it. And we can't have, once we've defined word as the smallest understandable part of speech, if we do that, which is a pretty good definition. I don't know what a dictionary would say, but that's a good enough one for me. Uh, so if we define it as the smallest, the smallest understandable part of speech, then if something is smaller and not understandable, it's not a word. And if something could be broken down into something understandable, and still, then, then it's also not a word. Right? It's, it's more than one word. And if you could break it down where both parts are understandable, like run er isn't, but run away, that's two words. Right? Um, so <laughs> you, you can break it, we can break it down. So that, that, that's good. But we limit it, we envelop. Uh, we find a little thing that it can be kept in. Right? We contain it. We, 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 we envelop it. And when we envelop something, what, what does it mean when you put something into an envelope? You envelop it in yeah. an envelope. That's what, you, that's what you do. Envelop is the word. Envelope is the thing. Seal. What? Seal. Yeah, you seal it. You seal it. Um, now, what is an envelope? A it is a rectangle, but if you there are lots of rectangles that aren't envelopes. Uh, but <laughs> it is usually I guess you could have any shaped envelope really, yeah. but most of them are rectangles. You're right. So where where, where do we? Uh, but if you were to describe an envelope, what what would it the, like? What we mail things in? It conceals information. Yeah, it conceals it. And really, the, the root word for envelope, for conceal, uh, if you look at an envelope, it's folded, right? It's folded pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. And to really, the, the root word here is to fold up. That's really what to envelope or envelope. Envelope means is to fold up. Um, that's well. That's etymologically what it means. That's not what it really means. I shouldn't talk like that. But that's etymologically what it means. It means to fold up. So in an envelope, something is folded up, or you can unfold it. And if we say unfold, using the same root word rather than saying word fold, but the same root word as envelope, envelop, to fold. And to unfold would be to develop, to unfold, mm -hmm. right? So to unfold or to expand something. And so people who are developing the field are people who are expanding what communication means, uh, what rhetoric means, what communication means. So as you expand that, you, uh, you develop it. And people who define the field narrow what communication means. Okay? So we can take probably everybody we've looked at so far, uh, but, I, but I'm probably going to just talk about a few who I really think did one or the other. Okay, So let's go ahead. Let's start out with Plato. We could start out before him with the sophists. I'll go ahead and start out with before him with the sophists, OK? Uh, before him, most of the sophists were, were expanding. I'll tell you, were expanding what communication was. They were, they were developing it. And every single thing they would do, it would count as communication for them. 
So then we get to Plato and Socrates. Uh, what are they doing? Defining it? Yeah, I think they're defining it, right? Because Plato is limiting, especially if we look at the Phaedrus. You remember the Phaedrus? Plato limits what at least good communication is. Sophists didn't care much if it was good. But, you know, you're the true lover, who the true lover is. And the true lover is somebody who, who seeks the good of the one he loves in the Phaedrus. And so the true speaker is, is only truly good communication if you are seeking the good of the people. So he narrows it. And then Aristotle, his student, what do you think he did? Mm -hmm. I would say he developed. Yeah, he, he does do a lot of things. He's very narrow. Now he says silly things like, there are two kinds of proof. <laughs> yeah. And of, those ki of this kind, there are seven kinds. And of that kind, there are eight kinds. So he is, you know, he's pretty narrow. Uh, so you could definitely make an argument that he's defining it defining communication, but he is moving it beyond Plato's definition, right? He, he is, he is he, he's moving it beyond, uh, beyond just this little thing of, of seeking the good for your audience. Because Plato probably wouldn't have accepted anything as true communication if it doesn't seek the good of the audience. Aristotle's kind of okay if you're seeking your own good. He doesn't want you to be mean to your audience. He doesn't want you to be unethical. But he's okay with that. You know? He's expanding it out. And he's, he's developing, uh, developing the field. And he has a definition of rhetoric, uh, which is a fairly narrow definition. Uh, finding in all given cases all the available means of persuasion. It's a fairly narrow definition. So... I can definitely make the, the argument that he's defining rather than developing. But I, I think you're right. He, de he develops it. So, how about the Romans? What do you think they're doing? Cicero would tell you. Mm, defining? Okay, why? Because they were trying to Because they focused on like really specific aspects. Like the sublime, right? And the sublime, they kind of broke it down. And the arrangement. These are the forms of arrangement. Uh, you know, this in an arrangement, you'll have an exordium, narratio, partitio, right. uh, refutatio. And if you don't do that, you're not communicating, right? That they would say that, you know, if you are not, the five canons are right. invention. Style, arrangement, memory, delivery. So we have a we have this is it. This is I think they're they're defining. There is some expansion that really does go on, and and some and some developing that goes on uh, in the Romans. And you could say, well, yeah, they did narrow it, but what did Aristotle really say about? delivery and memory and style. He didn't say much about those. He was so focused on invention that even though he talks about those, you know, they developed those. Mm -hmm. So you can make an argument for both. You could make an argument for both. Uh, but you can see, I, I think, that, that the Romans were really interested in, as Aristotle had been, there are three of these, there are four of these. But I think he went beyond Plato when he did that. Um, but very interested in so, so there's kind of both. There's kind of both. Um, then then when we got into the Christianization with a, with Augustine especially. They developed. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, because there's a pattern, right? <laughs> so, I see a pattern. Yeah, the, there is a pattern. How, how did they develop? How, how did the Christians develop? Well, they expanded it to something that was 
of the big this or does it deal with another aspect of what it was dealing with before? Yeah, as we start to get into the Christianization of rhetorical thought, in some ways, again, you could argue it defines it. Right. Um, in some ways, you could say, uh, Augustine really does accept a lot of Cicero and Quintilian's definitions and categories, and he doesn't break away from those, but he does expand what you can do in each of those categories. And actually, his big thing, he expands it into interpretation. Hmm. Up until this time, there had been, uh, up until Augustine, Rhetoric was really about the practice of rhetoric. Uh, but what Augustine really does is he expands it so that not only can the study of rhetoric be used to communicate, it can be used to understand communication. Um, specifically, he aims at the Bible. Uh, you can expand communication to understand this text. That if we break it apart into these things, the Cicero and Quintilian had broken, if we take start taking the words apart using that, we can get a deeper understanding of the Bible. But he actually claimed we can get a deeper over and that we can go out and read nature. And this is a pretty big expansion, maybe to the point that he's even wrong. Right, uh, that there may be, maybe when a tree is growing, it's not rhetoric. <laughs> maybe that's not communication. Maybe the fact that there's a mountain there is not communication. Now, of course, he would say it's God communicating with us. So if we can take it apart rhetorically, the fact that there's a tree and a mountain and a river, this is God mm -hmm. telling us something. And we just need to use our minds and figure out these natural signs. And God will reveal himself to us in nature. Um, I don't know. That's, that's uh, it's pretty wide. And, this, and it probably went too wide with that. Um, because well, probably God is communicating with us that way. I'm not sure breaking him up into the Roman orders is necessarily. That's kind of putting God in a box, actually, by by expanding rhetoric so much that it almost contains God. That's pretty big. <laughs> uh, that's pretty big. Uh, and Augustine, if I had said that to him, he's dead, of course, thousands of years ago. Uh, thousands of years ago. Thousands, thousands of years ago, that he's dead. Uh, but... Um, if you said that to him, you're expanding rhetoric to it's God, he would probably have freaked out. Uh, he's like, no, that's idolatry. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So maybe the Bible says rhetoric is God. Uh, so anyway, the, 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 the thing is, yeah, he really, really expands it out there. Um, and then there is. It's going to continue to follow the same pattern, a narrowing with the people we call. Uh, if you were in that chapter towards the end of the Christianization, um, rhetorical thought, it talks about people, especially it aims at Peter Ramus. Uh, but Ramus was what we call a scholastic, and there were lots of them at the time. And uh, he went to on to define. Uh, he went on to define, and in fact, he over defined. I I would argue uh, that he over defined, because for Ramus and the other scholastics, they wanted to figure out how each thing could set into a narrow confine, right? And so as, as each thing set into a narrow confine, Ramus and the other scholastics would argue that logic and um, a 
understanding, logic, invention in general, that belongs to philosophy. It does not belong to rhetoric. Uh, so that leaves us with invention style, arrangement, memory, delivery. And he would even say, really, arrangement? No, that's not really rhetoric. Really what is rhetoric is style and delivery. So he narrows it. He defines it. And he defines rhetoric as just being, and a lot of times when we hear people talk about rhetoric, they're saying, you know, you're, ah, oh, that's just empty rhetoric. And a style is your verbal communication. Delivery is your nonverbal communication. That really does sound like it's about everything, right? Mm -hmm. It's either the verbal or the nonverbal. It makes sense. You know, Ramus was not, well, he might have been crazy, I, I don't know, but he was not crazy in his definition. It's either your communication is either your verbal or your nonverbal. And those things that are neither verbal nor nonverbal communication are not communication. Like logic, that goes in philosophy. Uh, like arrangement, that goes into study <clears throat> of languages. Uh, <clears throat> convention style, arrangement. Like memory, memory is uh, uh, probably he would have put that in philosophy too. So rhetoric then is style and delivery. He very much defines the field that way. And when we go into then the British and Continental Theory, which we just finished, I think, um, we go into the British and Continental Theory. They continue with Ramus's definitions. They don't radically change it. You have some of the epistemologists, especially George Campbell, who wrote his book, Rhetoric and Philosophy, that says, I need to do both. Um, and, and David Hume, too. We need to do both, rhetoric and philosophy. But he still sees them as separate arguments. Right. These are two separate things. And the epistemologists were more interested in, which we were, talked about last week, where the epistemologists were more interested in invention than they were in style and delivery. And so we're continuing. Those were the epistemologists. The belletra, what were they interested in? Um, <clears throat> getting back to like the original. Those, are, the no, no, those are the no, neoclassics. The neo uh, they were there. They were there. Yeah. They're finding beauty in the world, right? Yeah. The, the They were. They were very much. You were talking about Frankenstein and Romanticism yeah. <laughs> uh, when I came in from another class. The Belletra and Romanticism are intimately tied together. Um, intimately tied together. So. I don't know what class you're studying. What if I say? American lit. No, English. Oh, English, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> with Oob. With Kate. Mm -hmm. with Kate. Yeah, so so you're kind of at the same place with me yeah. as you are with her. Um, <laughs> British and continental theorists. British. <laughs> Yeah. In the 18th century, yeah, uh, yes, the same, same, same thing. You're looking at the same thing here with me as you are with her. Uh, only this is truly the philosophy, and that's truly the literature, right? Uh, so, so it's a, the, the same thing. But they, they, they do, they do out, go out. So they are looking for beauty, but they're looking for beauty not in nature the way necessarily a lot of the romantics are, although. They believe beauty comes from nature, mm -hmm. but their bell is beauty, right? and letra is letters. And what they're really looking for is beautiful writing. Mm. So we have the scholastics defining, then we have the epistemologists kind of taking that definition, although they say, you know, to do good rhetoric, you have to understand philosophy. To do philosophy, you have to understand rhetoric. But they start the two as separate. The belletra, style and delivery, 
define it even narrower. They only care about style. Which makes them sound shallow. Um, but they weren't. The romantics were not shallow. They thought deeply about beauty. And they thought deeply about the sublime. They, they pulled the sublime out now and, and, and bring it back. Uh, they think deeply about the sublime. And they think deeply about beauty and truth and goodness uh, and the relationship between the three. Right? Um, and so they, they do. So they aren't shallow, but they definitely define communication very, very narrowly. It is only the verbal communication. So that's a pretty narrow definition. The elocutionists and so you have George Campbell and he's what he's really doing is being an epistemologist and belletra at the same time by saying because even he doesn't deal much with his work. Uh, so he's just doing the same thing at the same time. He's, he's, he's saying, you know, I'm a, I'm an, he's mostly an epistemologist. But he also deals a little bit with beauty and the sublime and, and everything else that, that British continental thinkers were worried about at the time. Then you have the elocutionists, which um, they're British a lot, too. But a lot of those, we actually start to see Americans pop up at this point. Uh, Americans start to matter again. Sheridan, of course, he just read about, is British, I think. But his work has more influence, I'd say, here than there. But it didn't matter in New Mexico. Um, so more, more influence on the East Coast. Uh, more influence on this continent, probably, than he did in Britain. Uh, it was much more, much more important. So Sheridan, we just read about, much more important than. And we look at, at what Sheridan and what the other elocutionists are doing, and they're defining two. Rhetoric is just your non-verbal communication. And the elocutionists didn't care what you were talking about. They didn't care about style. They didn't care about logic. I mean, they did, you know, but really what we're studying is, um, really what we're studying as we look through the elocutionary movement, um, if you were to study speech, you wouldn't even call it speech. You'd call it elocution. And your great-grandparents, they would have went to college. They would have probably had a class in elocution. Oh. And it would have been this stuff. They would have learned that. And some of the greatest speakers in American history, this is what they this is what they learned. Right? They learn where to move your feet how to move your arms, how to intone your voice, and how to vary your pitch and your speed and your loudness so that you can move an audience. That's what they're really interested in. And it doesn't matter what you say. What matters is how you say it. Seems dumb. <laughs> well... I mean, because the, the way we look at the women, okay, that's a really good thing they added to this, uh, the American Experimentation on Rhetoric, and then we go to uh, women, chapter 11, women emerge as speakers. And one of the reasons women were this is, this is horrible. Allowed to emerge as speakers is because the study of rhetoric had been so narrow as to basically just be style if you study belletra and delivery if you study 
elocution. It would be either either style or delivery. And neither of those things are terribly dangerous. Invention thinking? That's dangerous. That's some scary stuff. We aren't going to let women do that. But they do. They do think. And the, the, the and, and but because we made this safe, women and it's not dealt with here. And maybe maybe I'll do another they'll do another edition. I don't know. They're kind of dying off. Uh, the authors of this book, uh, Golden's Dead. Marquist is old. Coleman is old. I think Dr. Sproul's probably hitting 70 here pretty clo close. He's young, comparatively. So there might not be another edition of this book. Um, but if they do another one, they might get into, we, we will get into, you know, in the, in the contemporaries, African-American rhetoric and Native American rhetoric. But it wasn't just women emerging in the 19th century. Uh, 1800 to 1900, that's the 19th century. It's not just women emerging. Also, people of color emerge as speakers. Uh, and the first women's university, Oberlin, appears at this time. And the first uh, historically black colleges emerge at this time. Right? And both of those groups, women and people of color, are dangerous to the status quo, right? I and mean, they are. The status quo has slaves when we start out the 19th century. By the end, slavery is done. But they have slaves, right? Uh, the status quo means that most women shouldn't be educated. It means that most... So, so we have this coming to women. And so in a way, because rhetoric had been... And, and to people of color, although that's not dealt with, but it is. It's definitely... This is, this is where Frederick Douglass comes from. Uh, he, uh, Booker T. Washington... Um, who else? Sitting Bull uh, for Native American. This is where they come from, too. Why were they, why did we allow, we being white, male, heterosexual Protestants, uh, that's me, why would I have allowed this? Well, why would I allow these dangerous, and it was dangerous. It was, see, there were states in this country where if you were black, you weren't allowed to read. It was illegal. We'll let them study rhetoric. That's not dangerous. Turned out it was, and was glad it was. So even though we're looking at very narrow definitions here, we see an expansion of a different kind, right? A different kind of expansion. Because instead of communication being owned, by, well, since, since the epistemologists, Protestants, right? Peter Ramus was definitely a Catholic, but since the Protestants, white, male, Protestants, that's who owned communication. But it got so narrowly defined as to be something like, eh, who cares? Anybody can have it. So it gets so narrowly defined that it's pretty easy to pick up by oppressed people at this point, women and people of color, um, Native Americans and black people especially, are able to pick it up at this time. And you really said, now there were, there were, Augustine was black. Uh, but, but he didn't know that because the word hadn't been invented yet. I mean, the word black had been invented, but not as a race. Uh, so it was going way back there. But since, since you know, it was owned by this narrow group of, People of, yeah, even still, Augustine was from Africa. I was going to say people of European descent. Well, people of intellectual European descent. Um, it had been owned by them. And so you can read this here, and, and chapter 11, where is Fox going in here? Uh, people like Francis Wright, um, Susan B. Anthony. I mean, you should know who she is. I have gone to school. Uh, you should know. I mean, before one, one, uh, one, in one of our discussion boards, somebody said, was talking about the role, I've never heard of these women, so they probably didn't matter. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but it, 
there's something to that. And I wasn't, my first thought, I jumped on there and was like, no, they do matter because they were in the development of women's thought. Then I'm like, you know what, there's something to that. And there is something to that. I never heard of them. So the truth is probably they didn't matter. They were important as we study this and kind of understand. Susan B. Anthony, you've heard of her, right? She was on the dollar and for, for a while. Uh, you've heard of her. She was the one who, you know, she's credited, w women go to her gravestone and put their I voted stickers on her gravestone, right? You've seen that, right, on Facebook. Uh, they do that. They do that. Uh, they go and they, they bring it because she definitely mattered. And we have women emerging in this period and people of color emerging in this period who definitely matter. They definitely matter. And so this is an expansion. But it's an expansion because it got so narrow. Um, but it's still pretty narrow. So based on the pattern where we see, where, that we see, where we can really look at 18th, 19th centuries, being a narrowing of rhetoric, although it did expand to more people, uh, especially as we come into the 20th century. Now, what, what do you think we're going to see in contemporary rhetoric? An expansion. It's an expansion. It's an expansion. So as we come into this, as you come into this next, in the next few chapters, you are going to see communicate the study of rhetoric and the study of communication expand actually to the point that we could have a class like this that you can either take as a philosophy class or a communication class. And it works just fine because we're teaching the same stuff. That's how much it's going to expand. Uh, but you'll see that expansion take place. And, and he'll actually, in the next few weeks, he'll actually be reading friends of mine. So this is, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. So. Next week, I didn't know. And the week after that, we'll start getting into people I know. And that's, that's, that's who you can meet. So if you write a communication paper and come to the National Communication Association Convention meeting with me, I will meet, introduce you to these people. Uh, so next week is the 8th, right? Next Wednesday? Mm -hmm. Does that mean that we have to see Yeah, next, that's right. That's right. So next week, we're not going into contemporary. By next week, I want you to present your paper on your artifact. So next week you present on your artifact, uh, or if you're taking it purely online, uh, you fix the Wikipedia page. Right. Okay, cool. Uh, but, uh, <coughs> uh, can you just explain the paper to me real quick? You study an artifact. Okay. Uh, whatever artifact you want. It can be a speech, it could be an advertising campaign, it could be a CD that you like. Uh, or an artist on a CD. It could be an artist, uh, a visual artist, a painter. It could be almost anything. Uh, you study a particular communication artifact, which means it's a, it's a thing. It could be anything, but it's a thing created in order to communicate something. You study that, and you study it in depth. And then in your next paper, you'll study a theorist. And then in your third paper, You'll apply the theorist's theory to the artifact. So you, you study the artifact this time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you got to kind of pick something that you can yeah. kind of build off of. Like, yeah. uh, so something I'm vague. What does that do? Wednesday. This Wednesday coming up? Yeah. <laughs> like today, today? No, 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 no. Oh. <laughs> tomorrow. Or not tomorrow. Next week. Next week. Yeah, All right. next Appreciate week. Appreciate it. All right, Professor. Yes, sir.